Our Father and our God, we're thankful for the privilege of being your children. We're thankful because we are able to belong to your family on earth, a family that is preparing for the glorious and marvelous second coming of Jesus. And Father, as we study in our subject today about the overmastering delusion that is going to take place just before the coming of Jesus, we ask for wisdom from on high. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the promise that you will answer our prayer when we come in faith. And so we ask that you will answer us because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. I'd like us to transport ourselves in our minds to the time immediately before the first coming of Jesus. Now we all know that when Jesus came, the Jewish nation was expecting the Messiah to come. In fact, they all claimed to be followers of the Messiah. And they believed that they understood the prophecies which announced the coming of the Messiah. And prophecies, there were many. There were prophecies about the fact that there would be a forerunner to the Messiah who would preach to prepare Israel for His coming. And of course, they knew about the ministry of John the Baptist. And actually there was a lot of excitement among the Jews because John the Baptist appeared to be Elijah, the precursor, the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah. Of course they knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. By the 70s they knew that at some point the Messiah would be anointed. They also knew by Isaiah 53 that the Messiah at some point would be cut off. In other words, he was to die as a lamb taken to the slaughter and not opening up his mouth. They also knew that lots were going to be cast over his garments. They knew as well that on the cross he was going to say, I thirst and into your hands I commend my spirit and my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All of these things were prophesied in the Old Testament messianic prophecies. And yet in spite of the fact that they professed to believe in the Messiah, they professed to be expecting and waiting for the Messiah, when Messiah showed up, they did not receive Him in spite of all of these prophecies. And so the question surfaces, why did those who were expecting the Messiah not receive Him when He came? I believe the answer is very simple and you can find it clearly revealed in the Gospels. And that is that even though they had messianic prophecies, they actually gave a wrong interpretation to those prophecies. They actually interpreted the prophecies according to the selfish desires of their hearts. They did not want the mysterious spiritual transforming kingdom that Jesus was going to bring. Actually they wanted an earthly theocracy. They wanted a Messiah who would be a military commander, who would bring order in society by the force of arms, destroy the hated Romans, the secular humanists, if you please, of that day and age and to set the Jewish nation high above all of the other nations of the world with Messiah sitting on a temporal throne. You see the problem with the Jews of Christ's day is that they were expecting the wrong type of Messiah. And this is revealed very clearly towards the end of the life of Jesus when Pilate brought out Jesus and Barabbas and he put Jesus and Barabbas side by side. And he said to those who were gathered, the Jewish leaders and many among the Jews who had come there at the period of the Passover, whom do you want me to release? Whom do you want as Messiah? 
Would you like Jesus, who is called the Christ? Or would you want Barabbas? And by the way, most likely Barabbas was also called Jesus Barabbas. So who do you want? Jesus the Christ or do you want Jesus Barabbas? Which kind of Messiah do you want? And of course we all know the response they made. They said, release unto us Barabbas. This is the kind of Messiah that we want. And lead Jesus the Christ to be crucified. Now it's important to realize who Barabbas was. Notice Luke chapter 23 and verse 19. Here we find what type of deliverer Barabbas envisioned himself to be. It says there in Luke 23 and verse 19, speaking about Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. In other words, Barabbas was a seditionist. He was intent on overthrowing the Roman government. He was the type of Messiah that the Jews were actually expecting and the Jews wanted. It's interesting to notice the comment that Ellen White makes about Barabbas. She has some profound insight into the character of this man, his aspirations and the methods which he wished to use. Desire of Ages, page 733, says this. This man, that is Barabbas, had claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed authority to establish a different order of things, to set the world right. Under satanic delusion, I want you to remember that, under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatever he could obtain by theft and robbery was his own. He had done wonderful things through satanic agencies. Gives the impression that he had done miraculous works. Once again, he had done wonderful things through satanic agencies. He had gained a following among the people and had excited sedition against the Roman government. Under cover of religious enthusiasm, he was a, a, a hardened and desperate villain bent on rebellion and cruelty. And so Pilate presented the two potential messiahs before the people. Jesus, the holy, blameless, innocent one who came to bring the spiritual kingdom of Jesus in the heart and Barabbas, the other so-called messiah who wanted to establish the kingdom by force from outside. In other words, a spiritual kingdom versus a temporal political kingdom. Now Jesus had taught all throughout his ministry that before the literal kingdom could be inherited it was necessary to have Christ's spiritual kingdom implanted in the heart. In other words, the preparation for ruling in Christ's glorious kingdom was found in living the message of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart, etc., etc. In other words, the heart had to be transformed in order to prepare the individual to participate in the glorious kingdom. But what the people of that day wanted, they wanted the glorious kingdom without the preparatory work of the Holy Spirit in the heart. They wanted a kingdom imposed from outside, not a kingdom implanted upon the heart. Notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 and verses 20 to 25. Luke 17, 20 to 25. It says here, now when he had, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, 
He answered them and said, now notice because when the Pharisees uh, actually wanted to know when the kingdom would come, they had a certain idea about the kingdom. <laughs> they had the idea of the kingdom of Barabbas. Someone who would arise, rally the troops, and from outside defeat the Romans and establish an earthly temporal kingdom with Messiah reigning on the throne in Jerusalem. But notice what Jesus says. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Now that's an old English word. Basically what it means with external show of power and force. In other words the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor, notice, nor will they say see here or see there. For indeed the kingdom of God is where? The kingdom of a God is within you. And then I want you to notice the passage that continues in verse 22. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, now the, here's the critical point, Jesus says the kingdom has to be in you. But now notice what we find in verse 23, and they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part of heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in His day. Do you notice here that first of all you have the kingdom planted in the heart and then later when Jesus comes you have the glorious kingdom. But the Jews of Christ's day failed to understand this. And therefore they rejected the Messiah. And what happened was that in the year 70 because of their rejection of the spiritual Messiah with his spir spiritual kingdom, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And the Jews were scattered to all of the four corners of the earth. Now this destruction of Jerusalem is really a type or a symbol of what is going to happen at the end of time. If you read Matthew chapter 24 the disciples asked Jesus two questions. When will these things be? When will the destruction of Jerusalem be? And what sign will there be of your coming and of the end of the world? So what happened in relationship to the Jewish nation is going to take place again but it's going to be on a global worldwide scale. So let's take a look now that we've studied what happened with the Jewish nation. Let's take a look at what scripture says about the reaction of the Christian world to the coming of the Messiah at his second coming. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 1 through 8 first of all. And I'm not going to dwell a lot upon these verses because I've studied them before with the church. I want to deal particularly with verses 9 to 13. But in order to understand verses 9 through 13 we need to say a few things about, about verses 1 through 8. And uh, as I'm reading along I'm going to interject some thoughts to refresh our memory about the meaning of these verses. Here the Apostle Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, Now brethren, concerning the coming, that word for coming there is very important. It's the Greek word parousia. I want you to remember that. The Greek word parousia describes the second coming of Jesus. Now brethren, concerning the coming or parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. In other words the Apostle Paul is saying folks don't let anybody convince you that the day of Christ has already come. 
don't let anybody convince you that the parousia has come or even that the parousia or the coming of Jesus is imminent now notice verse 3 let no one deceive you by any means for that day that is the day of the parousia the day of the coming of Jesus also called the day of Christ here for that day the day of the coming of Christ will not come unless the falling away comes first now that expression falling away in the original language is the Greek word apostasia in English it's apostasy so first you have the apostasy and then after the apostasy you have the parousia or the glorious coming of Jesus it continues saying for that day will not come unless the, the apostasy comes first and now notice what is connected with that apostasy and the man of sin is revealed let me ask you what is sin? as good Adventists you know the answer to that, First John 3, 4 the, it, it says very clearly there that sin is the transgression of the law so is this man of sin going to uh, encourage people to break God's holy law? absolutely and so it says, until the man of sin is revealed, must he have been concealed before then? obviously and now notice what he's called, the son of perdition in our last subject together we studied about the son of perdition who was that son of perdition? Judas Iscariot of course Judas Iscariot was an open apostate he blasphemed Jesus he was an atheist, right? no was Judas part of the inner circle? Yes. most certainly did he have the disciples deceived even till when Jesus sent him out from the upper room? absolutely did he actually claim to be following the Messiah? he even betrayed Jesus how? with a kiss in other words this antichrist so called is not going to be some blasphemous individual who is going to defy openly Jesus but he's going to be like Judas he's going to claim to be a follower of Jesus claiming to support Jesus but in an underhanded way he is going to betray the cause of Jesus and so it says here the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above, above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God now notice here that he's going to sit in the temple of God this has led many Protestant uh, Christians to say that the Jerusalem temple is going to be rebuilt and this son of perdition is going to sit in a rebuilt Jerusalem temple in the Middle East and he's going to claim to be God and most of the world is going to come and is going to worship him as God there in the Jerusalem temple but the simple fact is folks that the Apostle Paul uses that expression temple of God many other times in his writings 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Ephesians 2, 20 to 22, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 among other texts and every single time that the Apostle Paul uses the expression temple of God he's referring to the church he's referring to the Ephesian church, he's referring to, referring to the Corinthian church in other words the temple of God is not some rebuilt Jewish temple the temple of God spiritually speaking is the church built upon the foundation, spiritual foundations of the apostles and the prophets a spiritual chief cornerstone Jesus Christ and spiritual stones according to 1st Peter chapter 2 being built on the foundation and on the cornerstone in other words this antichrist is not going to sit in a rebuilt Jerusalem temple he is going to sit within the Christian church 
course that's where you would expect him to sit if he's going to be like Judas he's going to be right near Christ he's going to be right near Christianity in other words and then the Apostle Paul says in verse 5 do you not remember that when I was still with you I told you these things and now you know what is restraining so there was something that was restraining this man of sin, this son of perdition this individual who was going to sit in the church something was restraining him from manifesting himself the question is what was it that was restraining him? according to all of the early church fathers that I have read they understood because they were living during this period they understood the restrainer to be the Roman Empire particularly the civil power, the secular ruling power of that day and age in other words secular Rome or the empire of Rome had to be removed as a ruling power so that this power could manifest itself and of course we know that in the course of time according to Revelation 13 and verse 2 that the empire of Rome gave his seat, his power and his authority to the beast who is the same as the man of sin in other words the Roman Empire as the ruling entity was taken away and in its place sat a system which still exists today known as the Roman Catholic Papacy so the Apostle Paul says and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time of course that time is the prophecy of the 1260 years God said that he would reign time, times and dividing of time in other words he was supposed to arise at a certain time but then the Apostle Paul in verse 7 says for the mystery of lawlessness notice again the emphasis that this is going to be a lawless system for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work see even in Paul's day this spirit of antichrist this spirit of lawlessness was wanting to manifest itself and then Paul repeats only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way so we find here in a nutshell what the apostle Paul has to say about the concealment and the revealing of the Antichrist but as I was mentioning the particular verses that I'm interested in are verses 8 through 12 so let's go to verses 8 through 12 what's going to happen when this system is fully revealed and when its leader is fully revealed notice and then that is when the restraining power is taken away, and maybe I need to make a note of explanation the restraining power was taken away when the Roman Empire stepped out of the way and the Roman Catholic Papacy ruled however in 1798 the civil power took over again because it gave the papacy a deadly wound and so for 200 years according to even Malachi Martin who's, who uh, was a Jesuit before he died during these 200 years the civil powers of the world had ru have ruled but scripture says that the deadly wound is going to be what? healed in other words the civil power is going to step aside and is going to give rulership to this same system which exercised rulership during the 1260 years so this prophecy not only carries us to 1798 this prophecy carries us to the very end of time when the civil powers of the world which have stepped back and said we're not going to support this system are eventually going to support this system in other words they're going to allow this system to rule and that's what this period is speaking about and so it says and then the lawless one will be revealed that word revealed is the Greek word apocalypsis it's one of the three key words that are used to describe the second coming of Jesus there's actually three key words one is the word parousia the second word is epiphania and this word apocalypsis all three words describe the second coming of Jesus so let me ask you is the lawless one going to have 
A second coming before Jesus has his second coming. Sure, it's indicated by the word. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his parousia. Do you see that there's two comings here? One is the coming of the lawless one. The apocalypse of the lawless one, if you please. And he's going to be revealed, and then Jesus is going to destroy him with the brightness of his parousia, or his coming. In other words, we have two comings here. We have the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, and we also have the coming or the parousia of Christ. Now you're saying, yeah, but the word apocalypse is used, not the word parousia, to describe this counterfeit second coming. Well, the fact is, if you go with me to verse 9, you're going to notice that the word parousia is also used to describe the coming of the counterfeit lawless one. It says there in verse 9, the coming, parousia, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. So is uh, Satan going to have his parousia? Is he going to have his apocalypse? Or his revelation? Yes, both words are used. He will be revealed, he will have his apocalypse, and the lawless one will have his parousia. The lawless one will have, in other words, his coming. Is that coming going to take place before the coming of Jesus? It must be, because at the coming of Jesus he's destroyed. So he can't have his parousia after he's destroyed. So it must be that he's going to have a coming, a counterfeit coming, before the glorious coming of Jesus. Now go with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. Very interesting verse. You'll notice here in 2 Thessalonians 2 that it speaks about this lawless one. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. And now notice, with all power, signs, and what? And lying wonders. Now do you know that there's only one other verse in the whole Bible that uses this combination of three words? The three words power, signs, and wonders? only one other verse in all of the Bible that uses these identical three Greek words, they're not translated the same, but they are the three identical original words and they're found in Acts 2 and verse 22 and notice who it's speaking about in Acts 2 and verse 22 here Peter is speaking on the day of Pentecost and he says, men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man attested by God to you. By what? By miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So according to Acts 2.22, who did the power, the signs, and the wonders? Jesus did. God through Jesus. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're told that the signs and the power and the wonders are going to be done by whom? By the lawless one. The Antichrist and his false apocalypse or his false parousia. Must this mean then that this Antichrist is going to do many of the same things that Jesus did while he was on earth? Do you think he's going to perform many of the miracles that Jesus performed? Many of the signs that Jesus performed? Is he going to teach many of the things that Jesus taught? Yes, because the same words are used for Christ and they're also used for this lawless one who comes according to the working. In other words, he works the works of Satan. Now let's go back to verse 9 the coming of the lawless one, see once again the emphasis on trampling on the law, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who what? 
perish. Who are going to be deceived? Those who perish. Now the question is, why are they going to be deceived? And why are they going to perish? We have the explanation here in the text. Because they did not receive, notice this, the love of the truth that they might be saved. Why is it that they're deceived? Because they don't receive the love of the truth. Now here's my question. Which truth? Well you say truth in general. All of the truths of the Bible. They didn't believe in all of the truths of the Bible. According to the context there's one particular truth that is being spoken about here. It's not truth in general. It's not the truth about the state of the dead and the truth about the Sabbath, the truth about health reform, the truth about tithing, the truth about marriage, all of the truths that we hold dear. Although all of those are important and Antichrist in one way or the other is going to attack those. But there's one particular truth which is in view here. Let's continue reading. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason God will send them strong delusion. When it says that God sends them a strong delusion it means that they want to be deluded so God steps back He says okay if you want Antichrist that's fine. You have freedom of choice. I'm sorry. I'm sad. I wish you could be saved. I don't want you deceived. But I have to respect your freedom of choice. And so God steps back and in the Bible what God allows the Bible attributes to God. You remember the book of Job? What God allowed is attributed to God. God doesn't actively do it. People choose and God steps back and then Satan does it according to this. And so it says, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion. Now notice this. That they should believe the lie. Now in the King James Version it says that they should believe a lie. But in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, the word lie is accompanied by the definite article the. In other words, this isn't general lies, this is a specific lie. In other words, they, they are deceived, they follow a strong delusion according to this, because they believe what? The lie. Now the question is, what is the lie that they're believing in the context of this passage? What is the lie? We have a counterfeit what here? We have a counterfeit second coming of the lawless one. He performs signs and wonders and miracles. In other words, he's counterfeiting what? The second coming of Jesus. This is the lie that the world is going to receive. How many are going to receive it? Of course, just the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus. Think again. It's the Christian world which is going to be deceived because this Antichrist as we've already identified him sits in the temple of God. He's like Judas Iscariot. He's an insider. He's a pagan if you please disguised as a Christian. And we're talking about a system here. So in other words people are going to be deluded because they believed the lie. Now notice verse 12, that they may all be condemned who did not believe what? There it is again, the truth. Which truth? The truth about Christ's coming. The truth about how Jesus is going to really come. But they had pleasure in what? They had pleasure in unrighteousness. Let me ask you, are there many prophecies in Scripture about how things are going to transpire in the end time? Are there an abundance of Bible prophecies about the manner in which Jesus will come? Absolutely. And the order of events which will take place before Jesus comes. Do we have many? 
Yes, we have many, like the Jews had many prophecies about the Messiah. Does this prophecy clearly show that there's going to be an apostasy in the church and then Jesus is going to come? But what does the Christian world teach today? At least the conservative branch of Protestantism says that the church is going to be raptured to heaven and then the apostasy is going to come. Then the tribulation is going to come. And they're going to find themselves in the midst of the great tribulation without having prepared for it because they did not believe that they were going to go through it. And they'll be leaving themselves wide open to the deceptions of this Antichrist. Scripture makes it very clear that there's going to be a huge apostasy within the Christian church and then afterwards Jesus is coming in His glorious coming. My, my question is this, if there's going to be a great apostasy in the church it must mean that the church was not raptured to heaven. If the temple is the church and there's going to be a Judas who claims to be a Christian so much for the idea that prophecy applies to the Jews. See that's a distraction of the devil. He wants you to think that the controversy is over there. When the controversy is taking place in the United States and in Rome and you can't see it because you're looking in the wrong place. The devil is a master at smoke screens. At making you think that the controversy is where it really isn't. Now let me ask you, what kind of kingdom do Protestants in the United States want to establish? Is it that mysterious kingdom where God through His Holy Spirit implants the law upon the heart? Or is it a kingdom where morality needs to be legislated from outside a theocratic kingdom where things need to be changed perhaps by Capitol Hill maybe even by the force of arms, by legislation imposed from outside and not implanted in the heart. Isn't that the same thing that Barabbas longed for? Isn't that the type of Messiah that the Jews desired in Christ's day? See the idea is that Jesus is going to come and He's going to set up His millennial kingdom here on earth. And He's going to sit on the throne of David and he's going to rule the nations like a rod of iron and of course he's going to favor all of the Christians but what the Christian world wants is they want the kingdom without the preparatory work in the heart the work of the Holy Spirit in transforming the character transforming the life planting the law in the heart so that we love Jesus and keep His commandments not because the government says so but because the Holy Spirit says so. And you know what? When Christians believe that there's going to be an earthly millennium with Jesus seated on the throne they are leaving themselves wide open for the final deception of Satan and the counterfeit second coming. Because if you're expecting Jesus to come and stay on this earth at His second coming then this lawless one who will be here will easily convince people that he is Christ. Ellen White says in Great Controversy page 23 the great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world would be their rejection of the law of God the foundation of his government in heaven and in earth. You say well Where's the similarity between rejecting Christ and rejecting the law? Well the fact is very simple that the law is a reflection of the character of Christ. Christ is the embodiment of the law. Allow me to read you this interesting statement from uh, the book, of, actually from Signs of the Times, November 15, 1899. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage from Ellen White. As speech is to thought, so is Christ to the invisible God. He is the manifestation of the Father and is called the Word of God. God sent His Son into the world, His divinity clothed with humanity to make known in His life and character the attributes of the Father. 
that men might bear the image and attributes of the Father, of the invisible God. And now notice this, He, that is Jesus, was the embodiment of the law of God, which is the transcript of His character. So you want to know what the law is? Just look at Jesus. You want to know what it is to keep the law? Just look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the, gives the law body. He makes the law personal. And of course Jesus lived this life because the Holy Spirit was in His life. Not because He was required to do so. And you say, but Pastor Bohr, how can you say that the Christian world is going to be lawless shortly before the second coming of Jesus? Aren't they fighting to have the Ten Commandments put in the courtrooms and in public schools and in the legislatures? Isn't the Christian world really fighting for the Ten Commandments? Yeah, that's just the problem. They're fighting to place the Ten Commandments outside when the Ten Commandments should be placed inside. I delight to do thy will. Thy law is where? Thy law is within my heart. Now there's an impressive passage in the spirit of prophecy that I want to read. It's a rather long passage where Ellen White picks up on what we studied from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the lawless one counterfeiting the second coming of Jesus, having, having his apocalypse, having his parousia, and performing signs and miracles and wonders. Ellen White comments on this passage and I want to read it. It's, it's found in the book Great Controversy pages 625 and 26. Listen to this as the crowning act in the great drama of deception Satan himself will personate Christ the church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out in the air, Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued yet full of melody. Yeah, the devil can be melodious. In gentle, compassionate tones he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior, Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then, in His assumed character of Christ, He claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which He has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming His name by refusing to listen to His angels sent to them with light and truth. And now notice this, this is where I got the title from. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. She's referring to 2 Thessalonians 2. Now it's almost for the saints. It is not almost for the rest. She continues saying, how are we going to protect ourselves when this comes? She says, but the people of God will not be misled the teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. You know, sometimes we're not able to answer the devil, it is written because we don't know where it's written. <laughs> and worse yet, there are many Adventists that can't answer it is written because they don't even know if it's written. <laughs> I had somebody say, oh pastor, I don't much care what's coming, all I care is who's coming. And when I said, if you don't know what's coming, you're going to accept the wrong who. It's time that we get to our Bibles and study. 
and understand what is happening and what's going to happen because folks if, if we don't we will be swept by this counterfeit second coming and by the events that take place in the religious world it's guaranteed she says the teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures his blessing is pronounced upon the worshippers of the beast and his image the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath will be poured out and furthermore see first of all his teachings are not in harmony with scripture he's, he's saying that God is going to bless Sunday keepers instead of Sabbath keepers so his teachings are wrong but now notice and furthermore Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's coming in other words the way in which Christ will come the Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming this coming there is no possibility of counterfeiting it will be universally known witnessed by the whole world you say oh well piece of cake then when that antichrist touches this earth I'll know it's not Jesus it's one thing to have it up here and it's another thing to have it down here she continues saying only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth notice that the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive by the Bible testimony these will detect the deceiver in his disguise to all the testing time will come by the sifting of temptation the genuine Christian will be revealed and now she makes this very significant statement to Adventists she says this, are the people of God so now so firmly established upon His word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? You see it, you hear it, you feel it, but you say it is not Christ? Are the people of God now so firmly established upon His word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they in such a crisis cling to the Bible and the Bible only? Satan will if possible present them, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, listen to this, and tangle them with earthly treasures cause them to carry a heavy wearisome burden that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life and the day of trial may come upon them as a thief see even our everyday activities can get in the way of our spiritual relationship with Jesus I was saying in my Sabbath school class this morning things that are not bad in themselves but if they absorb all of our time and all of our attention they distract us from praying, from studying the word, from witnessing to others even that which is good can become a detriment to our spiritual life the rat race of life, the cares of this life means so is it important for us to know how Jesus will come allow me to share with you as we near an end several passages which clearly reveal how Jesus will come John 14 verses 1 to 3 very well known we can repeat it from memory let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions where is the father's house? in heaven thank you in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you where did Jesus go? to prepare the place? to his father's house, right? I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and stay with you no I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am that is in the father's house that where I am there ye may be also notice Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 these are well-known verses but it's good to review important things isn't it? it's good to remember these passages Acts 1 verses 9 through 11 it says now when he had spoken these things while they watched that is the disciples on the Mount of Olives he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel the men are angels 
who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Is Jesus going to return in the same way in which he left? Yes. Could the disciples see it? Yes. So much, idea, so much for the idea of an invisible coming of Jesus called the rapture where people will suddenly disappear because Jesus came secretly for them. Scripture says that when Jesus comes He will be seen the same way as when He left. Notice Matthew 24, 23 to 27, Jesus warned us about this. Then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive who is the target, if possible, the very elect. That's why it's the almost overmastering delusion. If possible, the elect. See, it's not possible. It's almost overpowering the saints. And now notice, see, I have told you before, and Jesus said, I'm, I warn you. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, go take a peek. Uh uh. Don't go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be as clear and as visible as a bolt of lightning in the sky. Notice Matthew 24 verse 31. Speaking about the coming, the glorious coming of Jesus says, And He will send His angels. What is He going to do? Why does He send them? he must be up here and he what? he sends the angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will what? gather together his elects from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other so he sends his angels and his angels do what? they gather the elect and what do you suppose they're going to do with the elect? have you ever read that it says that they will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What are the clouds? Hello? If they're caught up in the clouds, it's because the clouds came to pick them up, to gather them up, and then the clouds what? Take them up to where Jesus is. In fact, notice Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and almost every eye shall see Him. <laughs> Thank you, you're still awake out there and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And then of course there's that fantastic passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, the Apostle Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a silent shout, no, it says with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the what? In the clouds, clouds of angels, to meet the Lord where? In the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Incidentally, have you ever read in Revelation chapter 20 that after the millennium the wicked surround the city and inside the city are the saints? Well that city came down at the end of the millennium so the saints must have been in the city when it came down. So where was the city during the millennium? In heaven. The devil is preparing the Christian world for this great overmastering delusion. 
and he's doing it through the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. See, it won't be too much of a stretch for them to accept a false Christ if they become accustomed to going by what their senses say and by what their feelings and their emotions say. That's the way most Christians live. Christians live. It's from one emotion to another and one feeling to the next. And not by a thus saith the Lord. And I dare say, folks, that if someday John Paul II or the purported spirit of John Paul II should appear in different places of planet Earth, the majority of the Christian world would believe it. That's right. If you saw his funeral. If the Virgin Mary purported should show up, the Christian world would say, well, it must be Mary. But the fact is that the Bible tells us that the dead don't know anything. The Bible tells us how Jesus is going to come. And we simply must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We must learn to live by it is written. But in order to live by it is written, we must read the Bible and study it and make it part of the fiber of our soul.